Coming from Easter, uh, we've seen that the death of Jesus was not the end of the story. It was merely the beginning of the next part of the story. The resurrection proves that. The resurrection, listen to this, was the start of a whole new existence for humankind and for the world as we know it. And I want you to tie down the word new because we will definitely get back to it later. That's actually the second point in my sermon. You think about our series that we've had on the resurrection. We saw with the people on their way home to Emmaus that the resurrection has a profound implication for our hearts. For our souls. And I'm going to use heart and soul uh, combined this morning. Because I, I actually think that heart and soul do belong together. But we saw as the people walked back to Emmaus and Jesus opened up the scriptures with them. Their hearts and souls were set ablaze. So one of the implications of the resurrection is that we have resurrected souls. A fresh new start with a completely new perspective. That's important for us to note. Second sermon. We saw that the resurrection enables us to follow the pattern of Jesus' life and to follow this pattern while we await a glorious inheritance, while we are protected by God Himself to receive this in full one day. That's what the resurrection means for us. Third sermon, we saw that the earth is groaning to be set free and to be made new. And it is confirmed that it will happen because Jesus was raised from the dead. So another one of the implications of the resurrection. We saw that the resurrection gives us a profound hope. This was more than last week. In the Almighty One. As the resurrection was Jesus' display of His authority. And also His resurrection guarantees the resurrection of our own bodies. Today, last sermon in the series, we'll see. Listen, it's a little bit of an earworm. All new things and all things new are what await us because of the resurrection let me say it to you plainly a resurrected world is what's on its way that's very very exciting so do you see the implications of the resurrection from small to big not quite sure what happened there do you see the implications from small to big from personal to corporate it really did change the world and it really will change your life. So from a resurrected heart and soul, to a resurrected body, to a resurrected creation, to a resurrected world. All because Jesus was raised from the dead. Brilliant. Now, I want you to think end times. I want you to think of end of the world parties that has been held before, that have been held before. As a result of a certain calendar drawn up by someone to predict the end of the times. Do you guys remember that? The 21st of December in 2011 was a huge end of the world vibe. Think of all the left behind movies you might have watched or read the books. Think of all the post-apocalyptic movies that we have on the screen. Right, Something happens and then there's this huge cataclysm or war. And then the whole world changes and it seems like everything's going to end. And then there's this one group or one individual left behind. And then they have to figure out what to do. Think the book of Revelation. I don't know if you've read it before. You can read it in two and a half hours in one sitting if you have the stamina. Think Revelation. Think also about conspiracy theories being forwarded on WhatsApp that tries to explain who the current day characters are in our political landscape and how they link to Revelation. You must have seen those things. You must have heard those things. Question to you. How do you feel when I mention all of these things? How do you feel when I mention all of these things? I suspect that we have a split in the room. I suspect that some of us might go, Woo! Love this. Bring it on. I'm really, really interested in it. And I suspect the other half might go, Ah, oh, dude, this is so tiring and difficult to understand. I'm not even going to go there. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Everything else, I don't need to know. I suspect we have a split. I've got a picture for you on the screen of coriander. Coriander. That splits a room in two. What do you guys think? Half of us will go, oh, I love coriander. Dude, if I buy Buddha balls, I love the taste of good old solid serving of coriander. Some of us might go, eh, I can't get that into my mouth. I suspect 
as Coriander splits the room. All of these things that I've mentioned also splits the room. Now, I would like to put it to you this morning that this was not the intention of the writer of this book. The writer of Revelation, called John, had a different intention when he wrote this book. Let me show it to you. Let the Bible speak for itself. Revelation 1, verse 1 to 3. The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Here's the purpose of Revelation. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it. Because the time is near. We are supposed to be excited when we open up Revelation. It just asks for hard work to get to the full understanding of it. Because we live in a world that is different to the world that John lived in. And this is important for us. So John lived in a world that looked completely different than the world we live in now. In a different language, in a different cultural context, with different things happening around him. And he wrote in that world, in a language with symbols and metaphors that those people understood. Let me show you a picture. If I show this picture to you, and I give the mic to each and every one of you now, you will be able to speak for 30 minutes about this picture. Why? Because we all know what's going on here. We know where it comes from. We know how it felt the first time. We know this whole vibe about the pandemic and people being sick and all the destruction caused in the world and blah, 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 blah. Like all of us could speak for hours about one simple photo, the elbow gate. Why? Because we live in this world. We understand the metaphor. We know what's going on. And when you read Revelation, the same counts for Revelation. John wrote in ways and in words and in symbols that everyone knew exactly what he was talking about. And he assumes that you know it because he didn't write it for us. He wrote it for anyone who would read it at that time to take heart, knowing that the time is near. So let's work hard today to truly understand these five verses. And let's be encouraged by the truth of it for our here and now and for what is to come. Are we on board with this? Are you guys keen? Three simple points. What is going on yet? I'll explain verses 1 to 5. Second point. What is significant about the word new? Remember I told you to tie that down. And third one. What does this mean for us? So three really simple points as we land this series. Let's look at point one. What is going on here? John sees a new heaven and a new earth. Rudolf, is it possible to have all five verses up for us? Please, I don't think that the scripture was up when Kone read it, was it? Okay, so let's have all five up there. Spoiler alert, I bolded and underlined every time he uses the word new. For some reason, Avenir as a font doesn't show bold that well, but it does show underlined. John sees a new heaven and a new earth. In place of the first heaven and earth, that's what he sees. And he sees that the sea has passed away or has fled away from the presence of God. Now this, I'm just going to take a quick segue, is a good example of a metaphor or a word or a symbol or a sign being used in this type of book. The sea features in Revelation. So in Revelation 4 verse 7 it features, but it's not chaotic. It's as flat and calm as a piece of glass. And then at the end of Revelation, the sea passes. It's gone. It's not even calm anymore. Does that mean that there will be no sea in the world hereafter? No. It means that what the sea resembled in the first century changed when God entered and changed again when God made everything new. And the sea resembled chaos. It resembled unformed chaotic order. It resembled evil, it resembled danger, and it resembled, um, what is bedreiging in Engels? A threat. It resembled a threat to humankind's existence. Now John says, in terms of what he sees, if God is present, then there's no threat. Because the sea is calm in front of him. 
And God doesn't want anything to threaten humankind in the world you're after. So therefore the sea will be gone. Do you guys see? It's just it's a quick segue of how the writer uses things that everyone knew what he was talking about, but we just don't know. So we, when we think of the sea, we think of the beach. We think of waves. We think of body surfing. We think of pompuinkis and shells and gazebos and suntan lotion and that kind of vibe. That's not what the people in the first century thought about when they heard the word sea. So it's exactly the same as the elbow greeting photo. All of us know what we're talking about, and all of them knew what he was talking about. So that's what he sees. Now, it's interesting that such an important colossal moment has only two short references. Do you guys see it? I mean, think if you have to make this first sentence into a movie. A new heaven and a new earth because the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. That would be a trilogy, guys, of three hours each. But it's only a simple sentence in the book that we are currently reading. Why? Because the people who read it first expected this to happen. It's not new news for them that this replacement or this being made new or this transformation will happen. They had prior knowledge about what was going to happen. They knew that from there to here, something had to happen. And when they spoke about the heavens and the earth, they spoke about there, here, and everything in between. So it's supposed to be an all-encompassing way of thinking about it. So in our language, if I had to translate this, that would be translated as everything was new and everything we knew had gone. That's kind of what this first sentence says. Now, this comes from somewhere. Remember, we are at the end of a huge 66 volume book divided into two huge parts called the Old and the New Testament. Where did this story start? I would like to show it to you. Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 to 2. Well, so we can just have that portion of scripture on again. In the beginning, this is where it all started, God created. And what did He create? The heavens and the earth. And what did the heavens and the earth look like? Tohu vavohu, it says in Hebrew, wild and waste, formless and empty. And there was darkness over the surface of the deepest part we could possibly imagine. That's the best way to translate the surface of the deep. And what was there then? It was the Spirit of God. And what was the Spirit doing? The Spirit was hovering. And as the Spirit was hovering, it was creating. You guys remember? So this is where the whole story started. And this is also where the whole story is going to end. So the people who knew the history of the Bible knew that at some point where we started, we are going back to. And that's why when John writes this, he can make this simple reference. We are now there. Right? This is what I am seeing. This thing that we've been expecting all along is now happening. The destruction of heaven and earth as we know it was part of the gospel tradition. Matthew 8, 5 verse 18, same text is written in Luke 16 verse 17, Mark chapter 13 verse 31, same verse written in Matthew chapter 24 verse 35, same verse written in Luke chapter 21 verse 33. Jesus himself, as he taught these words that I just quoted, predicted that at some point something will come to destruction or something will be destructed. Now, this expectation that a new heaven and a new earth will come to us and that it will resemble something like the paradise is something that we find in the prophets. If you've ever read the prophets in the Old Testament, many of them saw this day and spoke about this day where we will go back to paradise. We just started in Genesis chapter 1 in paradise. Isaiah 65, if you want to write it down, verses 17 to 25, is probably the most vivid reference to this new paradise. So this idea that we saw in the first verse is based on the supposition that a transformation of creation is necessary. Did you hear the word transformation? From one thing to another, being formed new. It's necessary so that the perfect life of the eternal kingdom will be set within a perfect environment. It makes sense. Like if you look at the sin and destruction in our world, you have to imagine that this can't be paradise just as it is. Something has to change for it to become paradise again. And then John says there's this descent of the new Jerusalem. 
And this descent of the new Jerusalem, which also resembles God's presence, is accompanied by an explanation from the throne that God now dwells with His people and that all death and suffering are now eliminated from the human experience. Why? Because we're going to go back to the paradise where bliss and perfection existed and it needs to be reinstated. Do you guys see that? Rudolf, we can have the first five verses up again. Now, I just want us to really hear this. And I want us to just sit in this for a while. Look at those words. Death. Mourning. Crying. Pain. When did someone die in your life? When were you mourning? Are you possibly mourning at the moment? Think of the last time you had a good cry. Think of pain you've experienced. Do you see that that will all be eliminated? That is some of the best news we can receive this morning. No more of it. None. Gone. No place for it. And then verse 5, and this is me landing the first point. There's a summary of the central message of Revelation. And look at it. I am making everything new. And you can believe this. Because it is I, God, the Alpha and the Omega. The one who was, is, and is to come that's speaking. And I have not changed. And my words will neither. These promises will remain true. Now, I could actually end this sermon right here. Because I do believe. That just this short explanation, explanation should give us enough hope. Let's take it a couple of levels deeper. So that was the first point. The first point was what is going on here. I hope that you've got a good grip on these five verses and where they come from. Point two. What is the significance about the word new? Now all of us speak various languages. And there's one rule for all languages. And that is sometimes we use the same word to explain different things. And sometimes we use different words to explain different things. So think about the word shop. Food can be shop. My marriage can be shop. Holiday can be shop. Where it can be shop. Like we use one word to explain so many things. Other times we use different words to explain. Now we have the word new in English. But the language Greek in which the New Testament was written actually has two words for new. Let me show you an example in Mark chapter 2 where Jesus teaches and he uses both words. Look at it with me. Oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, just before we go to that example, let's do this first. So here's the two, uh, the two words. Neos and kainos. Neos means it's new in time. It's young, it's recent. I'll give you an illustration. Kainos means it's new in quality. It's a different ball game. It can do something else. It's new in its nature. Let me show you an example of Jesus teaching this in Mark chapter 2. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Jesus is talking about neos wine. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No. They pour new wine, neos wine, into New wineskins. Kainos wineskins. Okay? So new wine needs a new quality wineskin. It needs a wineskin that can do something that the previous one couldn't do because of the fermenting process that's going to happen. And so wineskins in that day was made of animal skin. Think leather. Think flexible. Think flexible, flexible tear. That's why if you have new wine, you have to put it in new wineskin. So Jesus used these words as he spoke them. And if we translate it into English, it looks all the same, but it is not. Let me show you a picture. So here's an illustration for what is Nemos, new in time. It's young, it's recent. This is an iPhone 11. It's a new version of something that has already existed. Like the iPhone has existed, this is the 11th version. I thought about this yesterday, probably one day, Ava, when she's a teenager, she will have the iPhone 33250XTRR Mini, or something like that. I mean, I couldn't even count the amount of galaxies that there'll be at that, state, at that point. 
So it's new, it's recent, it's young, but it has existed already. Let me show you a second picture. Who of you remember this bad boy? The flip open two hours of battery life Motorola. Like you couldn't even switch off the keypad tones. Do you guys remember that? And if you didn't pull out the antenna, there was no signal. My dad had one of these bad boys and I thought that was phenomenal. He got this after he had a car telephone, which I also thought was kind of cool. So this is a cell phone. Next photo. This is a Kainos cell phone. Do you guys see the difference? Like the Motorola was a cell phone. The iPhone is also a cell phone. But this was the very first iPhone. It is Kainos. It's new in its nature. It's new in its quality. It can do way more than the previous telephone could do. Do you guys see the difference of the word new, neos, and the word new, kainos? Now, quick Bible points. Every time John uses the word new, which one do you think he uses? He uses kainos. So John uses the word that has to have us understand that he's not talking just about a new version. He's not talking about a small upgrade. He's talking about something that will operate on a whole new level. That's important for us. When he talks about heaven, when he talks about earth, when he talks about the new Jerusalem, when he talks about everything that God makes new, he talks about a new quality, a new capability, new possibilities. And they all go with this new world that we will inhabit. That's an amazing prospect for us. And that's something that has to, one, compel us to keep going. And secondly, it has to stir our imagination. Because what will that be like? Think about everything that you've ever experienced on this world that is glorious. And then think about that being kainos. Not just a little bit better, way better. Way new with way new possibilities. That's the significance of the word new. And in this portion of scripture, John says, God makes everything new. Isn't that just a phenomenal prospect? So if you think about the sermon title, All New Things and All Things New, I would like to just insert a little equation mark in there. All Things New equal all new things. Because even though something will be similar to this world we inhabiting, uh, uh, to this world that will come, it will be brand, brand new. And all things will have that quality. Isn't that great news, guys? That's what we need it! Okay, second. What is significant about the world new? I hope that you understand it. And if you are a really staunch Galaxy Android guy, or a Huawei, or a Xiaomi guy, sorry guys, it was just the illustration, right? We're not evangelizing anyone for the old iPhone. Okay, third point, and I will land for this. What does this mean for us? And the reason why I think this is an important question is as Christians, we often make the mistake of thinking that all we can do is to wait it out. I mean, you have heard this probably, said, prayed, and taught sometime in your life. This is something that lies in the distant future, everything I've said up until this point, and it has no bearing on my life now. That is a mistake. That is not something that we should believe or interpret the scripture to say. Listen to this line, and you've heard it many times. When I die, I will go to heaven. And one day, heaven will come to earth. That is actually not true. Because the resurrection of our hearts and souls has already happened. That's really important. It's not something that only lies in one day. It's something that has happened already. We are seeing the signs that this renewal of the earth is busy happening. Do you guys remember the second sermon? Paul says that it's groaning. It looks like childbirth is about to happen. We feel the longing for our, our resurrected bodies as our earthly bodies waste away. It is a lived experience for us to age and to experience that our bodies are wasting away. But while we experience that, we have the hope and the assurance that we will have resurrected bodies. 
And this all means that the end time has already started. We are living in the end time. And that is important for us. Like if you think of the Bible, and you think of creation, and you think of the fall, and you think of the story of Israel, and you think of the story of Jesus, that's all history. But then if we progress in the New Testament into the story of the church and the Holy Spirit, we're still there. Like in 2022, we are in the history of the Bible, and then this last part which I read this morning will be the completion, or the restoration, or the redemption of it. Currently in my own Bible reading, I'm starting Romans today. And I'm like tuning myself in that Paul will be speaking to me. Because he's speaking to the church. And I'm in the church. Currently. Like it's not a word for the people in Rome and then the people in Thessalonica and then the people in Galatia. Like Paul will be speaking to me. Because we are in that part of history. I wouldn't want us to hold to when I die I will go to heaven and one day heaven will come to earth. Let me pose this question to you. If I love... Will heaven come to earth? I think that's a way better question to ask than just waiting it out for one day. That's a question that I want each of you to ask yourself. If I truly love, will the effect of that be that heaven will come to earth? Think of the Lord's Prayer, guys. It was about what's there coming here and not what's here going there. Let it be on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus had a, a, a different perspective on it, I believe, than our common everyday Christians that we have, uh, or the perspective that we have today as Christians. Our lives matter because God is working this renewal through it. Do you guys realize that? Like we are part of the process. God will bring it to completion, that's what Revelation 21 says, but He chose to use us as His church in this end time to work this renewal into our current time until he brings it to completion our lives matter it's not about just chewing it out until we can one day go there and then hoping one day that will come here it's about living in the reality that if i live according to god's purposes and empowered by his spirit then heaven will start to come here because it will be done through my life let me show you two portions of scripture that will just nail this point home. Two really, really well-known scriptures. One is in 2 Corinthians 4 and the other one in 2 Corinthians 5. This was Lord Denny's benediction last week. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being present continuous tense. It is still going on. We are being what? Renewed day by day. Do you guys want to guess what word Paul is using there? He's using the word kainos. We are being transformed into something that has a new quality, new purposes and new possibilities every single day. It's not just a little upgrade. It's a total change. Let's look at another place where Paul uses the same word. In 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17. If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. Kainos. The old is gone. And the what is here? The new. The kainos is here. It's not something that we are waiting for. It's something that is already a reality for us. We had a conversation at City Group this week of how do we experience the power of the resurrection? Guys, this is how we experience it. At least one of the ways. When you testify that you were this, but now you are this. Or you were like this, and now you are like this. You are testifying to the power of the resurrection in your life. Old Rhino was selfish Rhino, aggressive Rhino, jealous Rhino, insecure Rhino, greedy Rhino, lustful Rhino, addicted to alcohol Rhino. That's who I was. And I am not that anymore. So who changed me? And what changed me? And what am I now? I am Kainos Rhino now. A new kind of human being. Day by day, God is doing this in my life. The old is gone and the new has come. That is how we know that the resurrection and the power of the resurrection is in our lives. There are other ways too, but I really want us to see this. Because as God is doing this, 
He's renewing us. He's renewing our households. He's renewing our families. He's renewing our schools. He's renewing our communities. He's renewing um, all the broken systems and things that place people of power on the top and people who don't have power at the bottom. He's renewing the world through renewing us. That's really, really important to see. So even though we hold on to this hope that one day this glorious thing will come to completion, we should not make the mistake to miss out what God is doing in our lives now. And what He's doing in our lives now is literally what this text says He will do to everything we know at one point in history as He brings everything to completion. New, 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 new. He makes all things new and He makes all new things.